would have been received by the astronauts. Um, you know, these are these are small, high energy particles that can penetrate the skin and give you radiation sickness. So, I mean, that that could be a headache, or it could be low blood count, but it it, it could be cancer. It, it could be fatal. Mm. No, I think I, I, some of them. I think some of them actually experience the particles that you're talking about, Lucy. I remember interviewing. Um, this was for another program uh, some time ago. Now it was Charlie Duke again, an Apollo 16 astronaut, and he was talking about there was a uh, an experiment that was cu- conducted while they were on the way to the moon. It was a very strange occurrence. To with the flashes, with, the flashes, exactly alike? the scintillation inside the eyeballs, mm. the flashes, and I I got to look. Uh, there was a chap who was a researcher in Houston who I also interviewed, and he showed me uh, very high-powered scanning electron microscope images, of very, very high-powered images of the helmets of the astronauts. And what was shocking is you could actually see where these very high-energy um, particles had burrowed through the, uh, the, the, the helmets, and, of course, they would have ended up passing through through the brain, and the astronauts were seeing these flashes. I'm told uh, that in the earlier uh, flights, the early Apollos, uh, the astronauts were seeing these things. And, and to our uh, viewers and listeners, uh, they, they would have appeared like, um, like streaking meteors suddenly across the field of view, and the astronauts reported seeing them about one, once a minute. At first, they didn't say anything because being old-time test pilots, I can tell you as a pilot myself, I'm not a test pilot, just a small uh, airplane owner, that uh, you never report anything that's wrong with you to any aviation <laughs> well, exactly. physician. You just, you just know never to do that. So they didn't, but uh, some of them were talking to each other, and they realized they were all seeing it. And uh, uh, Mission Control knew that, uh-oh, you know, that these were mostly protons, high-speed protons from the sun. And, uh, uh, you know, what could they say? Everybody knows this isn't good for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think even... Um, Inside the, I mean, I, I said that the Earth has this magnetic field and that it, it blocks the particles from the sun. And that's, well, I kind of was truthful, truthful when I said that because it blocks most of the particles coming from the sun. But some do make their way in and then they get trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. And um, the particles then that are trapped also have high energy. And there are various processes that act on these particles and can uh, increase their energy. So even once you're inside the Earth's magnetic field, you still feel the effects of high-energy particles. So even astronauts on the International Space Station um, will probably see the same effects um, as, as the Apollo astronauts and, and are still at risk of, um, of, uh, of, of cell damage because of these particles. Is that what gives what rise to the, the aurora, Lucy? Ha, ha, you know, the, the northern lights, the, the, yeah. the sort of shimmering lights we see in the sky at night if we're in northern latitudes and southern latitudes. Is that is that the same sort of process? Yeah, yeah it's exactly the same thing. And, um, you know, they're, they're the most beautiful manifestation of the fact that we have all these charged particles coming from the sun into the Earth's magnetic field and then being energised. And then they are able to... We don't fully understand the processes, but they can spiral down the Earth's magnetic field lines and hit the Earth's atmosphere. So oh, yeah. We're, 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 yeah, we're, we're looking forward to that. We get them up here in upstate New York uh, uh, fairly often. I think it should be mentioned that a swarm of particles from the sun has its own magnetic field, and only if its field is opposite to ours. Of course, Earth has a field with north up. Uh, so only if the uh, the field is opposite will it transfer its energy to us. Otherwise, it will be channeled harmlessly away from us. But the ACE uh, instruments, the ACE spacecraft, located almost a million miles sunward of us, is the first place that can actually measure the magnetic polarity of the incoming particles. And so this doesn't give us a lot of warning, which is why you often hear that an aurora may happen if there's a CME or other great event on the sun, but half the time it doesn't because the magnetic polarity has to be uh, has to be correct. And I also understand from... Uh, I spent three years up in Alaska as a uh, aurora lecturer and we always went to the uh, talk to the experts at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks and one of the fascinating things up there is that if the uh, energy really is transferred and the uh, super high electricity is generated uh, in the uh, in the high upper atmosphere then um, what essentially happens is the electricity itself and just correct me if I'm wrong Lucy with this 
uh, causes, of course, electrons to be either stripped or excited to higher energy levels, mostly from oxygen. And then as they tumble down, uh, they emit light at that 5577 angstrom uh, wavelength. And that's there's that beautiful uh, green of the aurora. And you'll notice that I'm, I'm saying angstroms and I'm betraying my age uh, here. Uh, people who are listening will know that uh, nanometers are now essentially used, but when I studied this stuff in school, yeah, back when I was a kid, sunny boy, uh, we only used angstroms. So I still think in angstroms. I, yeah, have to... I, I think in angstroms as well. That's Do you true. really? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hooray. <laughs> so is it, is, it, is, it, um, is it the case then that the, this, this exc- excitation, it's sort of glowing like a neon sign? Is that how it works? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, that, that's how I think of it as well. And, um, you know, there's, there's a switch that gets flicked on somewhere thousands of kilometers above our heads um, wow. and, and makes them glow. And actually, yeah, there's, there's a mission called Cluster, which is um, it's a European Space Agency mission. I mean, there are NASA missions as well that are up there orbiting the Earth right now trying to understand how that switch gets gets flicked on to produce the aurora. You know, it's something that humans have been looking at, well, ever since the dawn of mankind, and and still we're, we're trying to find out what's happening up there in, uh, in our magnetic field. Now, Lucy, since you're, this is your field of uh, expertise, and no doubt you're, 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 you're paid to go to places like that, it may not apply to you, but for listeners, and maybe even for Duncan, if you really want to see the aurora as the sun is now heating up toward its uh, probable maximum uh, in 2013, get to not just central Alaska, but the best place under the auroral oval, which is like a glowing donut, uh, surrounding the magnetic uh, pole of Earth uh, is uh, China Hot Springs, which is this marvelous place about uh, two hours east of uh, Fairbanks, right in the smack in the middle of Alaska. And it's so dark there that uh, they're right under the auroral oval, and about half of all nights they get amazing displays of the uh, Northern Lights. So if you want to get there cheaply, I'm, I'm going to, again, give a plug. I feel shameless about this because I don't make any money from it. Uh, Bob Berman, that's me, Bob Berman Tours.com. Go online and it'll show you. We're, we're, we're going back to that China Hot Spring next March for the Aurora. Uh, but you really don't need me. Uh, you, you really get to that part of the world and you'll have the absolute highest probability of seeing the uh, those rich greens and uh, sometimes even deep cherry reds also mostly from oxygen if it's high up or or, or nitrogen if it's low down uh, from the aurora. I believe that's at uh, um, a uh, 6400 angstrom if I if I remember correctly about the same wavelength as those uh, red laser pointers ah okay yeah, yeah. You sound like you've seen a lot of aurora. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We even get them here, as I say, in upstate New York. Uh, uh, the ones there, though, are just uh, so alive that they, they make the mountains of uh, Alaska emerald. They make them green. You look around for 100 miles in all directions, and all the mountains are green. That's how bright the, uh, the sky becomes. Do, so. Do they uh, look, um, oh, sorry, do they look better when you take a photograph of them? Because I've, I've seen so many images on the Internet now, and someone told me that your eye doesn't pick up the color as well as the camera does. Usually that's true, but if an aurora is really uh, intense, you definitely see the the green, that pale green. As I say, it's 5577 angstrom, so it's right smack at the uh, peak sensitivity of the uh, of the eye. And uh, uh, I'm getting so excited here. I'm hearing like tons of feedback. Okay, that's that's a lot better. And there's. Um, uh, the reds are a lot harder because, of course, the eye is much less sensitive to red light, especially at low light levels. But you'll sometimes get that deep cherry red uh, as well, especially on the fringes. Up there, you're right underneath the auroral oval, as I said. So it often looks as if you're – the best way I could describe it is if, if you were a drunk that fell asleep on the floor and then awakened under some draperies – that were somehow glowing. Let's say you were living next to a nuclear power plant and all the drapes were glowing in your house. And you're looking up right from below and seeing glowing draperies with the bottom fringes pink or red and the rest of it uh, green. That's how it looks there, shimmering and slowly undulating and changing their appearance. So you very much do see the colors uh, with the eye. 
the um, of course the uh, the film uh, makes it a little more. Uh, that's a, a more, that's a pretty uh, vivid uh, pretty vivid uh, picture you paint there, Bob. It sounds amazing. It, it, I, I remember I saw I saw it briefly once from my parents' home in in the UK, but that was back in 1989, and I think it was a period, Lucy, when the sun was particularly active and had sent off you know quite a lot of. Uh, coronal mass ejections. Oh, we had March 13th that year in 89. We had That's just an amazing was. CME yeah. and we had auroras that went all the way down to Mexico and the Caribbean. That's, it was be- yeah. it was very it, it wasn't very animated. It was more a sort of homogeneous sort of uh, red uh, glow, but it was still pretty spectacular. It's the only time I've ever seen the aurora, but it was uh, it was pretty good. Uh, Bob, I've got a quick question for you. I'm just looking at the eclipse here, and that, that just on the um, on my uh, on the website here, the SLU website, there's a snap pick button. What what does that do? Oh, that lets you uh, lets members of SLU you click on that, and it's your picture. And it's just on your computer forever. You can also press some other buttons and send it to people. And uh, uh, it's just a, a great convenience. People can do that uh, okay. when we're looking at that supernova so in the share, Whirlpool galaxy or uh, anything. So you can, share, you can share pictures that way, can oh, you? Oh, yes, yes. You capture them. So not only can you make the, the uh, telescope point wherever you like on right. SLU, but then you can take and, uh, and keep pictures and even, like, kind of uh, drop it the way... Uh, you know, the way Buzz Aldrin would sometimes say, when I lived on the moon, that's what he'd actually say. He'd say, when I lived on the moon, and I always thought, come on, it was just a couple of days. You shouldn't say I lived on the moon. Like if I visited uh, London for two days, would I say when I lived in London? But he used to say that. So you can take these pictures and you could say, yeah, I took that picture through the SLU telescope uh, last night. And, and it would be perfectly true. By the way, I want to say that this event, this live lunar eclipse is sponsored by Transformers, Dark of the Moon. That's the new Michael Bay film in cinemas from June 29th. The only way to see it is in 3D. Okay, we're here with our guests, uh, Lucy Green, a uh, wonderful solar astronomy astronomer in, uh, in England, and with Duncan Cobb, another wonderful uh, astronomer who's uh, just done marvelous things. It's uh, an honor to be with these guys. I'm uh, Bob Berman, your host here. I'm on the other side of the world in the United States, and we're watching almost uh, getting towards the end of the total part of the eclipse. But then following that, we're going to have the partial phases, which are also very cool. I'm up to talking about anything whatsoever. Um, Anyone? I'd love to hear from Lucy a little bit more about the um, the sun. I think there was a, um, uh, a coronal mass ejection quite recently. It was I saw some pictures from uh, a satellite. I, th- I think it was called the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Yeah. And I hadn't seen a absolutely mind-boggling images. They seem fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I saw them as well, but I, they they did come from Solar Dynamics Observatory. You're absolutely right, and I remember them getting circulated on the internet really, really rapidly as soon as the event happened. And that's that's a product of um, of the data of, of the images being freely available for anyone to have a look at. And there's a fabulous website called Helio Viewer, and anyone you don't have to be a solar scientist, any member of the public can go to the website and look at the images and make your own movie. And that's what people did. But yes, you're right. There was a coronal mass ejection that was so spectacular. I, um, I have to confess, I, I thought it was a fake. <laughs> I, thought, I thought people had photoshopped the images. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go back and get the NASA data and have a look myself to convince myself it, it was real. Right. And um, the reason it was so spectacular was because there was so much material that was thrown up into the sun's atmosphere. So these coronal mass ejections are... Um, they're, they're, they're magnetic bubbles, but they also carry the gases of the sun's atmosphere with it. And they, they get ejected into the solar system. But this time, a lot of material also fell back onto the solar surface. And that's yes. what created these beautiful images. Did you see them with all these dark yes. structures? Yes, it, it, was, it, was, it was incredible because it seemed to me, of course, that the, the magnetic magnetism is invisible, which is always a bit of a bane for 
solar astrom- astronomers apparently because you can't you can't actually see those magnetic field mm. lines but but as this material was falling back 